Good afternoon, everyone. You are very welcome to the Healthy Eating Active Living Programme, shaping the healthier food environment across healthcare settings. The panel will be delighted to receive any questions you may have. Please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your PC laptop screen. If you are using an iPad, you will find this feature located at the top of your screen. Without further ado, I will now hand you over to your MC for the day. Sarah O'Brien, National Lead, Healthy Eating Active Living Programme. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon on shaping a healthier food environment across our healthcare settings. We have a really exciting agenda this afternoon with a great mix of contributors across policy and practice. All the contributors will be joining me on stage for a Q&A um, before at the end. So please do use the Q&A function, as Jean said, to submit any questions you may have for our panel and for our experts. And I'm looking forward to a really interesting discussion with them all. So first, a little background on the Healthy Eating Active Living Programme. Established in 2016, it is one of a number of policy priority programmes in the HSE who work to implement national policy and the Healthy Ireland agenda across our health services. Our remit is to mobilise the health service to improve health and well-being by increasing the levels of physical activity, healthier eating and healthier weight across service users, staff and the population as a whole with a focus on children and families. In terms of national policies, our focus is on driving the implementation of Healthy Weight for Ireland, Obesity Policy and Action Plan, as well as the Get Ireland Active National Physical Activity Plan across the health services. The Action 6.13 in the Healthy Weight for Ireland Obesity Policy tasks the HSC to review and improve the quality of food in hospitals and develop a food and nutrition policy. So we're going to be sharing a lot of the work today that has gone on over the last number of years to um, deliver on that action. So why focus on healthy eating? A healthy dietary pattern is associated with reduced risk of chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancers and obesity. Treating chronic disease is a significant cost burden for the health services and for us the taxpayers who fund our health services. About 40% of adults in Ireland live with at least one chronic disease once they reach the age of 50. And over half of our acute hospital's budget is spent on treating chronic disease, with up to 80% of GP visits being due to chronic disease and their complications. For individuals and their families, there is also a significant cost in terms of reduced quality of life and increased risk of earlier death. The Healthy Food for Life guidelines developed by the Department of Health with input from the HSE, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, Safe Food and the Irish Nutrition and Dietetic Institute sets out what a healthy dietary pattern should look for all, like for all of us across all ages for people in Ireland. However, we know from research that most Irish people are not currently meeting these guidelines. So there is some work to be done to both communicate the guidelines and also put systems in place that encourage and support people to change behaviour towards achieving a healthier dietary pattern. For many of our staff, and particularly patients and service users in our hospitals or residential services, we in the health services have an, a lot of influence on their access to healthy food and healthier diet. Healthcare related malnutrition is highly prevalent and causes poorer clinical outcomes for our patients. Even patients who are nutritionally well op can often become um, at risk of poor health due to poor nutrition over their time and care. We're the largest public sector employer in the state. Our staff are our most valuable resource. Supporting their health and well-being in the workplace is a priority for Healthy Ireland in the health services. On the sustainability front, the HSE spends over 40 million annually on food. And we know from some figures in 2018 that around 25% of this ends up as food waste. Over the years also, the quality of food in healthcare has featured in the National Patient Survey results and there has been negative media coverage of food provision across our health services. All of these add up to a strong rationale for focusing on improving the food environment across the healthcare settings. So what does improving the, healthcare, uh, the food environment in the healthcare look like? We now have a suite of nationally agreed policies developed with input from clinicians and catering professionals within the health services. 
These set standards for what food provision and the food environment should look like for our patients, service users and staff. We also have a range of tools and supports for staff working to improve the food environment across healthcare, including a series of training modules on HSE land, learning and sharing events like today and the event we held last uh, September, as well as um, schemes such as the Healthy Happy Heart Healthy Eating Awards. Work is continuing with health business services to ensure that through food procurement groups and framework contracts, catering services have the capacity to purchase products and ingredients to offer healthier food choices. So to share our vision for a healthier food environment in healthcare, I'd now like to welcome Marion McBride to speak with you. Marion is a registered dietitian working with the Healthy Eating Active Living Programme. She has responsibility for health and well-being within our programme and with Emer Cotter has been instrumental in making today happen. So Marion, can I invite you to come to the stage? Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for that strategic overview um, of the policies, guidelines and standards. So what I want to talk about today is about implementation, about what it looks like for each and every single one of us on the ground every day. And to do that, we have a short two minute video that looks at our vision of the healthier food environment and the benefits to our staff and to our patients and um, what it will look like on a day to day basis. So if we could have that video now, please. As part of the HSE's drive to introduce a healthier food environment in healthcare settings, we have developed nutritional policies, standards and training. Catering facilities across Ireland are working towards rolling these out. This video demonstrates our vision and the benefits to our patients, staff and visitors. Joan spends a week in hospital. At home, he wasn't eating well, but during his stay, Carmelita, his nurse, puts him on the appropriate diet to meet his nutritional needs. He is given assistance with eating and all meal times are uninterrupted and enjoyable. Noreen, the catering assistant, is collecting plates from John's ward and notices less food waste on food trolleys and plates recently. This is since the Nutrition and Hydration Steering Committee introduced new measures for portion control and the timing of some meals. The catering department have completed all their nutrition training modules on HSC land. Anna, the head chef, is now creating a new, easier menu flow, including all diets, to meet the needs of the food, nutrition and hydration policy. Her team are focusing on healthier cooking practices to ensure healthier options are provided as part of their Happy Heart Healthy Eating Award. Peter from IT is in the staff restaurant for lunch. He sees healthy tasty lunches with the calories displayed on each option. He looks forward to choosing lunch every day and making the healthy choice is an easy choice. Today, the catering department are celebrating achieving gold in the Happy Heart Healthy Eating Awards and there's a free portion of fruit with each main meal for all the staff. On his way back to the office, Peter picks up some healthy snacks from the vending machine for his afternoon break. Why do we want to improve nutritional care for patients? Well, implementing a healthier food environment for patients means that we can support those at greatest risk. Today, one in three patients who are admitted to Irish hospitals will be at risk of malnutrition. This means that they are coming into the hospital either undernourished or at risk of being undernourished. And so we want to be able to identify them, place them on the right diet to help them to build themselves up, or at the very least, keep themselves as built up as possible during their hospital stay. We want to do this so that we can stop or reduce weight loss in hospital. Currently, seven out of 10 patients who are discharged from hospital are discharged weighing less than when they came in. So screening patients, putting them on the right diet 
And initiatives such as Making Mealtimes Matter mean that we can not only provide the right nutritional care, but also the right environment for patients to enjoy their meals in peace and also to get the right assistance to help them to eat and drink well. So for patients like Joan in the video, this means that he could have a shorter stay. If he's nutritionally well and he has a wound, it will heal quicker. He's less likely to get pressure sores and he's also much less likely to have or to get a healthcare associated infection. And what this can mean for him is that he will have a greater chance of going home with independence or at the very least needing less care and support and better quality of life. Patients who don't, do not receive great nutritional care are more likely to have more GP visits, more prescriptions, and are much more likely to be admitted to hospital. John wants to get better. He wants to go home, go back to normal, and he wants to enjoy life. So rolling out these policies help John to do that. And why do we want to improve healthier options for staff and patients, or staff and visitors? So making a healthy choice, we want to make it an easy choice. And it is important for our staff and our, our staff to look after their health and well-being. We know that what we do every day really matters in terms of preventing long-term chronic disease like heart disease and cancer. When Peter goes to the staff canteen, he not only has the opportunity to refuel, but also to recharge, to improve energy levels for the afternoon. So a healthier food environment should not just be the opportunity to do that, but the opportunity to make sure that you're feeling better for the next part of the day. So some of the opportunities that we have within the HSC um, are also around our challenges. We know that it's a challenge for recruitment, for example, for chefs. We know that we are in competition with all of the rest of the hospitality industries. However, healthcare is one of the opportunities where chefs can learn lots about various different therapeutic and modified consistent diets. And we also can provide continuous professional development through HSE land. We also know that each and every day there are, can be problems such as supply chain problems. So even regular ingredients might be difficult to get if there is maybe um, a strike or like, for example, the food shortage with the Ukrainian um, situation at the moment. So what we would say is when these difficulties are arising, we recognize that it may be more difficult to implement sort of longer term plans um, when dealing with day to day crises. So when there's an opportunity to get involved with the local or the national procurement contracts, I would urge each and every catering department to make sure that the products they need to be able to deliver their service are on those contracts. And finally, let's look at unexpected events for a moment. Over the last couple of years, we've had the cyber attack, we've had COVID, and we've also seen over that time catering departments making great inroads and in implementing so many of these policies. And I hope that the next number of minutes and the next presentations will provide ideas, links and pathways to training, etc. that will help to implement those further. So thank you. Thank you very much, Marion. Thank you very much, Marion. Since 2020, we have been working very closely and partnering with Irish Heart to provide healthcare sites with access to the superb support, mentoring and accreditation that's available through the Happy Heart Healthy Eating Awards scheme. So now I'd like to welcome Regina Rattigan, registered dietitian currently working with the Irish Heart Foundation uh, in the audit process for those awards. Regina has supported many sites through the process and today she is going to share with us her top tips for striving for success. Welcome Regina. Thank you Sarah, thank you. Thank you for having us on today. Um, yes, my name is Regina and some people might recognize me from doing the audits um, because I've been doing them for so long now. Uh, I'm not going to say how long, but I'll, I'll definitely know some people that are watching today. And I just want to take this opportunity to actually thank um, all the wonderful people I've met down through the years because doing audits is a challenge and, you know, it's not something that maybe people look forward to doing. But I have to say, um, I've been up and down the country and every site has always made me feel extremely welcomed. Um, and I've always made it a really enjoyable experience for me. I really actually enjoy doing the audits. But I suppose Orna um, from the Irish Heart Foundation and myself just want to 
acknowledge all the work and the effort that goes into the awards. I think a lot of it happens behind the scenes, um, but we're very, very aware of it from doing the audits, um, the amount of work that people put into it. And it's extra work on what they have to do already. So it, it's really um, fantastic achievement when they do, um, you know, get through the audits and get the award. And also with two difficult years with COVID, um, it's fantastic to see that the enthusiasm and the motivation is, is so high. We're just kind of back, getting back onto sites now and the enthusiasm is as good as ever. So that's great as well. So I'm just going to share a couple of slides. So, um, so I suppose today I've been asked, like Sarah said, to kind of just cover the, um, I suppose the common challenges that people come up against again and again. And to be honest, whether you're going for bronze, silver or gold, it's always the same challenges that I would hear from catering teams on the ground. And the biggest one, and everybody will know this, is always the chip free day. So the chip free day, um, again, can come up as close against the most resistance. And again, this could be due to the culture may have been to offer chips daily, maybe even on request. And, you know, now you're making changes. And of course, change is difficult. Um, you know, we don't like change. It, you know, you're, you're going out of your comfort zone and people like to keep things the same, particularly maybe menus that they've been used to for years and years. Um, and people work, of course, on these sites for, you know, can be working there for a long, long time. So it's always that little bit more difficult then to make changes. But this is always the big one. And like I said, it, it's across the board, across all the awards. Um, people would always say to me, this is the, the most difficult one. But with lots of hard work, they get, they get, um, get it over the line. The other one would be cooked breakfast. Um, so customers, you know, again, they have been used to having the full choice daily. And now you're starting to remove a couple of items, you know, and it might be only for one or two days a week. But again, this takes a little bit of time to get used to. And then tea time meals, I put that in because this is where I would have seen the biggest changes and the biggest improvements down through the years where, you know, your typical tea time meal once upon a time was chips and sausages or chips and beans, very much reliant on convenient processed foods. But this is has really, really shifted now to, um, you know, people are always offering nutritious homemade meals, very similar to lunchtime or the salad bar may remain open for tea time or this baked potato with fillings on offer. But definitely the choice and the quality of food has improved hugely um, with the tea time meals. And then the other one is calorie posting. And the reason I put this in is because it can be the biggest challenge um, preventing people from moving from bronze to silver. And of course, we you know, want everybody to try and get to gold um, as much as possible. But usually, you know, once you get to silver, you have an awful lot of the background work done. Um, and there isn't a huge amount of work then to do to get to, to gold. So a lot of the time in my work, I would see that it's getting to the silver award can be sometimes the most difficult. Um, and that can be just down to calorie posting. Sometimes that might be the only one that's left, you know, the only criteria that they're missing um, from the audit. Um, because it can take a lot of work, a lot of project work goes into it. And like I said, it's extra work on, on top of what you have to do already. So suggestions we would give is maybe ask for help, um, try and outsource or at least share the workload that comes with um, doing the calorie posting. So you might have a dietetic student, you know, um, dietetic departments take student dietitians a couple of times a year. That would be a, prof a perfect project for somebody um, like that. Or a catering placement student um, might love to do it. Or there might be somebody in the team that you just haven't uh, thought about asking. Um, and they might love to take this on as a project. And it would just make it um, so much easier to get that, this, I suppose, challenge over the line. And then, like I said, once you get to silver, um, an awful lot of the work is done um, for you to actually aim for gold. So top tips for success. So the ones I always hear about um, is when you focus on the positives. And usually when we visit a site, you can tell straight away within 30 seconds um, of entering the restaurant, whether it's a positive um, attitude or a positive vibe that's been taken on board to do with the audits and people are brilliant for like you know sending out really positive emails or doing really kind of nice signs you know in the restaurant and it's really promoting it <clears throat> and I'll have a few that examples in a couple of the other slides but just to focus on the alternatives being offered and the new additions so not to focus on the negatives you know not to have too much chat around you know how many tip free days and what's been taken off the menus so to really, really zone in on the positives and all the additions that you're making, whether it's new menus or new recipes or, you know, just new choices. Um, so it's really, really good when, when um, that kind of makes the process, I think, a lot easier. 
And then on chip free days and chefs would do this, you know, they would know straight away that I'm not going to take chips off the day that maybe the popular dishes with chips are on like lasagna or breaded fish. So always recommend to, you know, have the chips um, off the menu on days where they're not going to be looked for, where people aren't going to really miss them. So that could be when you have your, your roast or your pasta dishes or fish pie or shepherd's pie or some kind of, you know, dishes like that where we wouldn't normally be asking for chips um, uh, on the side. So that can really help with reducing the resistance around that. And then, like I said, it's focusing on the positive. So creating a bit of excitement, you know, and promoting um, the fact that you're going for the award. So to give people plenty of notice, you know, let all your colleagues and, and customers know that, whether it's by sending out a, a really, um, you know, nice email at the beginning to say, look, we're going for this award, um, we're going for this level, and can we please um, get your support and help with it? So maybe have a launch day or a health promotion day, you know, or even doing something over lunchtime, um, and, you know, can be really, it can really just change, I think, the whole uh, feeling around it. So this is a success story we had recently. Now, it's, it was a site that's going for the Silver Award, but I suppose I picked this one because I feel that if you get to the Silver Award, like I was saying earlier, you have an awful lot of work done and it doesn't, you know, um, may hopefully won't be as difficult then to move on to gold. Um, but this site had had the award years ago, but I'd let it lapse. Um, so I thought it was a good example. So they were starting from scratch. Um, so they had chips served and request, you know, so you could kind of um, request them as, as wanted. And then they made, made a draft move to chips only on Friday. So this was a big change um, for this site, but they, and they would have came up against resistance, you know, um, and they would have said that to me, but they kept working away at it and they got it over the line and it's, you know, still a work in progress, but it can be achieved with a lot of work and, you know, bringing people on board with you. The other thing they did was they used to have full cooked breakfast offered daily. That was just kind of culture, the routine. And then they started doing a happy Tuesday breakfast. So again, it's the language you use when you're promoting um, the audits or changes that you're making. So one day of the week, they um, are going to take process needs. Due to the criteria, they have to take process needs off the menu. So their way around this was to actually focus again on, on the positives, focus on the new additions. Um, also, something they mentioned to me was that they were trying to um, also, you know, work towards a environmentally friendly um, restaurants. So they were trying to reduce the, the use of plastic and they felt that there was too much of a selection of bottled soft drinks. So they actually changed over and had a limited selection of canned soft drinks. But of course, you know, when you're working in a hospital, it's not as convenient to be carrying a can of, you know, um, whatever it is around with you, going back to the desk or going onto the wards. Um, whereas you may do that with, with um, you know, the plastic bottles. So they had a double win here where they found that their sale of um, cans reduced dramatically. So their, you know, their, their sales of soft drinks. So not only reducing their use of plastic, but also it reduced consumption um, of soft drinks in the restaurant. So I thought that was a really good idea. Um, they also had some work done on calories, but they didn't have them displayed on the menus. So they had to uh, get working on that and get them up on the menus. Um, so it mightn't look like a lot of work, you know, um, a lot on the on paper, but this took a huge amount of work. Um, and, you know, it's, when you're doing the audits, you, you see how much work goes into it. And I thought this was a really nice um, sample. And it's just a small sample of the menu that they had done up for their Happy Tuesday because we couldn't fit everything um, on the slide for today. But again, communicating with everybody that we are signed up for the Healthy Eating Award, you know, help us win the silver. So again, asking for help, you know, um, rather than telling people, asking for help, asking for support. So these were the items that they were adding on um, after taking off the process needs. So really nice examples there, you know, sourdough toast with avocado, cherry tomatoes, pancakes with natural yogurt, fruit salad, overnight oats, you know, smoothies, um, just really nice, simple ideas. And like I said, their list was even longer than this, but I just thought that was a nice example to show people today. Um, and again, communicating when they're making the change, you know, there'd be no process meet on a Tuesday, but again, going with the positive language, they're calling it Happy Tuesday. So straight away, that makes you, you know, feel good. Um, they also had something, and I know um, the last speaker was talking about the healthy environments. And just when you walk into the restaurant, you see this corner where they have a healthy food corner where they're providing snacks, healthy snacks all day. Um, so homemade smoothies, fruit bowls, you know, nuts and seeds. And I just thought the feel it gave to the restaurant was really, really nice. Um, and I, the presentation was really nice. And I just think something that simple 
you know, that can be an easy thing to do, mightn't take an awful lot of work, but that customers really appreciate it. And I want to thank the catering department at the National Rehabilitation Hospital in Dublin for allowing me to use their examples today. So I suppose the main message is always keep striving for success, you know, so always um, uh, strive for the highest award you can achieve. Um, so there will be challenges, but keep striving. So keep working away at it, you know, and keep aiming for the, for the highest award that you can achieve. Um, there will be challenges, of course, that, you know, in all walks of life, when we're ever trying to change old habits, um, it never is easy. So implementing new ideas. Again, we kind of leave this up to the site. Some people find small gradual changes work better than trying to change everything all at once. Um, and that tends to be the case. But again, the catering teams know their customers best, so they'll know what works. So we leave that up to them. But I suppose just to be aware that it does take time. Um, and communication is key. So again, bringing everyone along with you when you're bringing, um, implementing changes. So, you know, maybe sending out that first email to ask people for support, letting them know what you're introducing, um, what changes you're making. If you don't have access to email, maybe one or two signs in the restaurant maybe having a promotion event or even the little table talkers can be a great idea on the tables. But I suppose keep it simple, you know, not too many messages, not too many emails, because of course that can get a bit overbearing. Um, so just that one or two emails. And again, when you win the award, to definitely let people know whether it's by email or again, a little event in the restaurant um, to thank people for all their support and just keeping that really positive um, feeling around the audit. So today as well, we want to encourage sites to always go forward for the recertification. So this happens every two years. And even if you're at gold, you know, it's just really important to keep it up. And I think it's a pity if people let it lapse and then you have to start from scratch again. So really, really encourage people to keep up the recertification, um, you know, and this could be an opportunity to, to try out new ideas and things as well. Um, but to please keep it going. And if you need any resources, any support, we have loads of resources around the chip-free day, cooked breakfast, um, a lot of tips around the challenges that people come up against and um, loads of support as well. So please get in touch with the Irish Art Foundation if you need any help at all with the audits. And that's me, thank you very much. I'll hand you back to Sarah. Thank you very much, Regina. Um, that was a really great, uh, some really great tips there at the end and a fantastic example from the National Maternity Hospital. So across the services, we know that there are many champions for the healthier food environment working away, making a huge difference for patients, staff and uh, service users every day. I'm delighted to welcome one of those who is with us today, uh, Anne Bodley, the head of catering at the Cork University Hospital. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we are in the um, journey that we are at the moment, um, bringing in the implementation of the nutrition hydration policy in Cork University Hospital. So just to tell you a little bit about Cork University campus first, um, there's four hospitals on site, um, the main acute hospital, uh, mental health unit, uh, the maternity hospital and the dental hospital. So on a daily basis, we would serve staff meals of over 1,500, um, patient meals, 830 um, plus, um, three times a day. Um, and then we would also have two snack rounds, one in the afternoon and one in the evening time. The, the style of uh, catering that we do there is cook fresh plated um, from a belted area in, in um, a food production service area. So, um, as you were all probably be aware at this stage, the, the policy was introduced for a couple of main reasons. And um, the main reasons really were for obviously to improve the quality and safety of food um, and nutritional care, um, to ensure that the um, areas of improvement were completed by HICWA. Um, HICWA did a big review of nutrition in acute hospitals. And so um, their recommendations were looked at. Um, also to ensure that we're supporting the clinical guidance um, and screening for um, in hospitals. And probably for me, and I, th I suppose most people in case would be the most important one is to improve patient experience and to make it patient central to, to our role in catering. So um, in Cork University Hospital, like all the acute hospitals, we would have a nutrition hydration steering committee. 
Um, so um, having read the policy, and I kind of have to stress reading the policy because, you know, you do need to read it from cover to cover because it's, it's a really, really um, good, good um, piece of, of, of information. Um, there is a toolkit that comes with it and we found that so, so helpful. So the first thing that we used was the gap analysis. So we were able to look at our menus, et cetera, and see where we were and what we had to do to improve. Um, the next thing we did was um, in, introduce an implementation plan. And with that, um, we looked at the areas that we really needed the most work on, and that was four main work streams. So at the time when we were, were starting to do this, um, ITSI was coming online as well, so it was all hands on deck to get over that over the line first. Um, the next part was the work stream part two, which was menu planning. The third one is food service, and the fourth one was assessment. So today I'm going to really concentrate on work stream two, but I'll talk a little bit about the others as well. So um, the first work stream was ITSI implementation, and what I found with this was firstly, it was, it was the first time that we really got together uh, multidisciplinary teams. Uh, we had the speech and language therapy department, which were wonderful help, nursing, um, the dietetics and catering. So we all came together um, and education was probably the most important thing here. Um, and I think for many years, catering particularly, maybe didn't have the knowledge, etc. Um, and it was shared very well um, to us. The, the tools both on the ITSI website and the um, HSC land were very beneficial for training for everybody. And actually the ones in HSC land we're now still using for, for new staff when they start in, in um, the catering department. So um, with that, we obviously had to change over. Um, we did check our menus and change them just to, to, to be in line with the guidelines and check that what we were doing was, was correct. Um, but obviously we still hadn't really touched on our menu planning, so it was just to get us over the line at the time. Um, what I would say now, um, and what we've continued to do is audit um, in the kitchen, um, on the food service belt and up in the wards, just to make sure that we're following all, all the, the standards correctly. So the second work stream, which was probably one of the bigger ones that we had a lot of work to do on, is menu planning. So obviously we had menus in, in, in stew already, but we reviewed them all and analysed them all with our dietitian, and we found there was a massive gap that we had to, to fill. So um, what I found particularly of help was the toolkits that were provided. Um, so even things looking at standard portion size was really, really important for, for our team. So they understood exactly um, what they had to do. The other important thing that we did was introduce teams um, and our chef team particularly um, was an important um, part of getting the menu planning done. We have ample chefs, well, I wouldn't say ample, but we have chefs in our kitchen and sometimes they're not given the opportunity to shine and get their view across. So we used, um, you know, for a couple of months, we played around with a bit of food. We gave them an opportunity to come up with their own ideas for, for menus. And like I found particularly um, with the, with the, say, the great two chefs where they were, you know, kind of in the, the industry for a couple of years, they were able to share their wealth of knowledge that they'd learned from the, the private sector. From there, um, we, we developed our new menus and we did a pilot for four wards and we reviewed where we were. With the information we had, we, we then tweaked our menus accordingly. We obviously had used nutritics to, to uh, ensure that we were hitting all the, the right uh, points in terms of nutrition. And then we introduced the menus. Um, and I know for a lot of people who don't work in catering, it doesn't seem a, a big job, but when you have 26 different wards, um, you have 20 different menus, and you're trying to do it all overnight, it was a big job. Um, and the team there were, were both in the wards and in the catering department, excellent in, in dealing with all the little tweaks that we had to do at the very beginning. What I also found was very valuable was the training modules on HSC land. So anyone who hasn't got in there to look at them, please do. Um, you know, particularly for new staff when they come in, you know, a lot of catering staff haven't worked in um, um, healthcare before. So it's a great, great um, point to use to, to, to get them have an idea of the therapeutic menus that we use. Um, the other areas that we had to look with then is food safety. 
food safety we would check obviously daily and we would review um, annually but because obviously we changed all our menus we also had to look at that. The other thing that we continue to do is, is look at our food waste. So um, I know my colleagues will be talking about it later, but it is very, very important, um, particularly in this day and age. So we would, um, on a monthly basis, um, you know, audit what, what we have not used as such. So um, we'd also look at the, the trays coming back from the patients and also in the canteen. So that is part and parcel of our, our daily tasks as well. The most important thing to me, though, is patient. Um, you know, the last couple of years, we haven't had the, the surveys available from a national level. So um, a lot of the time, the catering officers and the staff and the catering department made it their point to go up and check and see if people were enjoying their, the new food that we had introduced. What I would say is the most important thing is we have made improvements. Are we there where we want to be? No. But will we get there? Yes, we will. So, sorry, now just read for a second. Um, the work stream three then was food service. So um, we, we still have a lot of work to do on this particular one, um, but communicating um, the menu ordering system is, is something that, that we really do have to work on. At the moment, we would have quite a paper uh, menu ordering system. So there's human error, people changing beds, etc. It doesn't necessarily give us uh, the most up-to-date information. So we're hoping in, in the next year or so to, to hopefully go digital. Bed signage was completed with our speech and language department. And nutrition assessment, yes, it's done. Um, the last two years have been particularly difficult with staff shortages, etc. But um, the, the nursing team have definitely really pushed that forward. And um, Marion has mentioned the making meal times matter. Again, I suppose people didn't have a lot of visitors the last couple of years, which has made it a little bit easier. Um, but we now are, are looking at making sure that it's properly introduced across the board. Um, and monitoring and evaluation is something that we, we, we really, really have to push forward. So this is going to give you an idea of the menus that we're dealing with on a daily basis. And one of the, the um, tools in the toolkit was menu coding uh, menu matrix. So if you see down at the end there of the slide, it kind of breaks down different food items and what diet can have it. So we're obviously trying not to invent the wheel every day. So it's turkey on the menu. We try and get as many diets to be able to have it, be it just changing the sauce, et cetera, to go with it. So finally, the challenges in the future. I would love to say it was easy. It wasn't, and it won't be because we have a lot more to do. Um, communication between multidisciplinary teams can be difficult, particularly when everybody else has, has um, difficult things going on every day. Um, the menu analysis, getting someone to analyse, analyse our menus. We are quite lucky. We have a dietitian now available to us, but I know a lot of my colleagues in other hospitals um, are still getting difficulty with that. Um, and it's all fine to say a catering manager can, can analyse meals. They can to a certain degree, but it really does need a dietetics input too. Patient profile for me was also something difficult for us to deal with. We have such a cohort of patients. We have the acute hospital, we have the maternity hospital. So obviously those patients require different menus, etc. cetera. Um, the ward priority, sometimes nutrition isn't where it should be in terms of priority in the wards. It's definitely becoming more of a headline and it's great to see. So it's important that we continue to share, share our knowledge with them. And time, and it, it does take time. And I know I appreciate that everybody has had a couple of very busy years, but it's important that we continue to, to strive for our, our patients. So to the future, I've just given you a list of all the, the bits and pieces that we have to concentrate on in Cork University Hospital. Um, and what I would say is, you know, we've had our first opportunity of, to do our menus and now it's review and review and review. And I think before in previous um, years, we would have done a menu and given ourselves a clap and say, well done. But it can't be like that anymore. Our patients, they need to keep on top of things for them. So at the moment, we're going through a new review of all our menus and snacks to see, you know, what has worked, what, what we need to change. And we have at the moment, you know, we're looking at the results that we got it from our patient survey. So, you know, we're not there, but we're definitely going in the right direction. And, and I know a lot of my colleagues in, in different catering departments are all striving the same way to, to make sure our patients have something to look forward to when in hospital, because obviously when people are in hospital, 
the only thing they actually understand is food. So, you know, we should try and make an effort to, to make it an experience for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. A huge amount of work there in Cork University Hospital. Uh, very far along the journey, a, a further bit to go, but well done to everybody involved. In all of our work, I think it's always very exciting to find new and um, different collaborators and th those who share a similar goal but are maybe coming at the uh, agenda from a different perspective. In the, I think there is a, in the HSE there's a lot of synergy between the healthier food environment agenda and the sustainability agenda. So I'm delighted to welcome to join us today Stephen Murphy from the HSE Climate Action and Sustainability Office and Eileen O'Leary from Clean Tech, the Clean Technology Centre in the Munster Technological University. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, many thanks uh, for the invitation today to speak on food waste. Uh, myself and Eileen are very grateful for your time and, uh, and attention. Uh, just by way of background, the HSE Estates Climate Action and Sustain Sustainability Office has been in place for a number of years. And these are the main pillars under which we, we are currently working. Uh, just very quickly, let's say uh, under the built environment, uh, we, we have a capital development program in uh, this year of 1 billion euro. And we're looking at how we, we can build uh, sustainable uh, low carbon or carbon free buildings into the future. Also, we're looking at a Pathfinder project where we're looking at retrofitting our, our current building stock. You know, under energy, people may be familiar with projects happening in their hospitals. Uh, and over the last year, um, we we uh, produced over 20 million projects in conjunction with with SEIA. Um, then under waste prevention. Um, obviously, food waste comes under that under that heading. Now, the start point where we, we are currently at, uh, we have to put a structure and framework in place, you know, from which um, we can actually then start looking at the process. So, uh, at this point, we've put in in place four regional sustainability managers. Um, with a view that they will work closely with, with hospitals, including you know, catering managers, to see what initiatives we can put in place and in, in what way we can support uh, catering teams on the ground. Uh, in terms of dealing with the hospitals, the ideal situation is that each hospital would have a green team in place. Um, the idea being that on site, you then have a local team, you know, through which you, you can implement different actions. Um, to us, it's all about a partnership approach that includes uh, working with the likes of the OGP, where they have a framework in place that hospitals can, can sign up to. But through that, hospitals can, can make their waste handling more efficient, which also includes food waste. You know, so it's important to understand the actual uh, contract itself and what a hospital can, can get from a contract. And we're there to, I suppose, encourage um, hospitals to, to get the best service for, from their waste contractors. We're also working in partnership with Stericycle in relation to uh, clinical waste. And then for the last 10 years, approximately, in conjunction with CTC in Cork, we've been running the Green Healthcare Programme, which uh, looks at waste in particular and areas such as water conservation. But uh, food waste would be a big area that we're, we're currently focusing on. Um, this year also, we have a budget in place and we've set up a register of opportunities. So if you, know, you have an idea locally, you know, within the catering department, 
that you wish to implement. Um, the, the first port, port of call is, is to talk to your, your regional sustainability manager. And I, I've been encouraging them to actually build on that register so that it also forms justification for um, growing our, our budget exponentially year on year. You know, very simply as well, I think um, we have to simplify things. You know, it's simple things like making sure we have the right number of bins in the right place for, for recycling. You know, so there's no point in talking to people about you should do this, that or the other if you don't give them the tools or you don't provide the support structure and framework uh, for them to, to succeed as such. You know, once that's all in place, you, you can then look at process, you know, whether it's direct training, awareness training, collaboration locally, you know, on pilot projects. But keeping in mind, I think, you know, within the health service, um, every catering manager would, would have, you know, their own particular set of opportunities or res restrictions. So I'm encouraging the sustainability managers to you know, understand the local situation and to work closely then with, with the people on the ground, you know, uh, to make the necessary changes. So in terms of the scale of the challenge, um, you know, it's, it's black and white, reduce food waste by 50% by 2030. Um, you know, it's important to understand our starting point. So the regional sustainability managers will be establishing the baseline for each hospital. You know, the idea then being that um, we know where we are, we know where we need to be, and then we come up with a roadmap towards achieving our objective. And, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, it's, it's a big challenge, but, you have to break it up into bite-sized chunks, you know, and approach it from many different angles. Just to mention as well, you know, in terms of green procurement, um, you know, I, I think ideally we make changes before, before, before being forced legally, but uh, when it comes to green public procurement for food and catering services, you know, it becomes mandatory by 2023. So one of the things we are currently looking at is working with our procurement co colleagues, you know, to see ways in which we, we can improve um, our procurement process in terms of sustainability. And, you know, in particular, I think you have to look at it fr from the front end that it, it's too late to try and tackle a problem you know, um, because if you look at the bigger um, areas where we can affect the maximum change, I think procurement is one of the keys. I'll just ha hand you over now to Eileen, who will give you a bit more detail in relation to where we currently stand. And they've, they've done some excellent work over the last 10 years and, and have a huge bank of knowledge. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, we mentioned the targets already for food waste and um, people often don't realise that food waste is, is highly related to climate change and it's got the same emissions as uh, all the road transport in the world. So all the trucks, cars and buses on the road is the same as food waste in terms of carbon emissions. And the work we've done on green healthcare over the years, we've, we've shown that the cost of the brown bin for hospitals uh, is just the, uh, the tip of the iceberg, literally. Um, it's about 200 euros a tonne for food waste, but the purchase costs of the food that was bought originally and was meant to be eaten works out at about 2,000 euros a tonne. So this is always something to be kept in mind. So there's both environmental and financial re reasons for looking at food waste. Uh, a few years ago now, these, this is a dated figure and, and, and it's interesting, it's pre, it predates the, the nutrition guidelines, so it'll be interesting now to see what these results would be. But uh, at the time when we did some of the waste surveys, when we were right, getting right in under the catering manager's feet in the kitchens, uh, we found that um, we did uh, measure food waste being generated and the amounts go, uh, being eaten and the amounts going out as waste. And at the time, uh, it was just over half was eaten by patients. So there is some scope there. Now, of course, uh, the catering... Um, 
uh, in the healthcare sector is such a complex area. Uh, like we heard Anne outlining how the thousands of meals are preparing a day and multiple different diets. So there always will be food waste, but it's very interesting for catering departments to compare themselves with their peers across the country. And we uh, generated food waste benchmarks in terms of kg per bed day. So there are the average values we found and the lowest for acute and community hospitals across Ireland. And these Benchmarks are being updated this year by Stephen and his colleagues in the Sustainability Office, looking at where, where we are at now as, as, uh, as uh, in the HSE in total across the board. Um, as we kind of went around the, the catering departments in the hospitals, uh, we observed some, some very good practices uh, in terms of reducing food waste. And uh, we've put that together in an online training resource. It's just a very small 20 minute presentation um, that we've, we've uh, just got up onto HSE land. Um, and it's just on reducing food waste and tips and good practices going on in Ireland. So um, I'd just like to hand back now to Stephen just to wrap up to, for people. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, just very quickly, because I think we're running short on time. Um, you know, I'm very anxious that we, we kind of look to take action and, you know, from that point of view, the regional sustainability managers will, will be, you know, making contact with catering managers and kind of building a relationship and working towards collaborating together, you know, so kind of with that, um, I think, um, you know, it, it's about collaboration and work, working together um, and because catering managers you know they're, they're well well used to managing their own their own um, i suppose business as such it's not it's not our place to be telling people how to do their job but um, we'll be there to support anyway in terms of sustainability thank you thank you very much stephen and eileen for a really insightful uh presentation and some very uh interesting statistics and targets there set for us all our next and final contributor before our panel discussion has been recognised as one of the top 100 women changing the landscape in Ireland today and is winner of the Irish Food Writers Guild Award for Outstanding Contribution to Irish Food, former executive chef, chef at the Rotunda Hospital and now executive chef of Pure Joy. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Joyce Timmons. Thanks a million, um, Sarah, for that gorgeous introduction. Um, so, as Sarah said, I'm Joyce. I'm here today to talk about pushing boundaries in a healthcare setting, chat about kitchen life, how to simplify it, and shaking things up. Um, also talk about the Blue Zone countries um, and their secrets to longevity. Um, so over the next 10 minutes, now I could talk about this for um, hours, but they won't let me. Um, so over the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna give um, an introduction to myself, um, tips on how to simplify kitchen life, the Blue Zone countries and their secrets to longevity, um, and then finally shaking things up. So, um, as I said, again, I'm Joyce, just in case you just forget. Um, I'm the exec chef of Pure Joy, bringing joy back to eating. Um, it's kind of a con consultation business. I help with um, implementing ITSI um, for in healthcare. Um, for aged care and also in hospitals. Um, I'm not long in healthcare. I'm in healthcare cuisine about five years, six years. Um, my previous employment history was in some of the finest kitchens around, um, two Michelin star restaurants, Le Mamois Quatre Saisons for, under Raymond Blanc and restaurant Patrick Guibault. Some of the leading hotels of the world, the Marion Hotel, the Killarney Park, uh, the Conrad Hotel. Um, I left that kind of life. I had my daughter, so I went back um, trying to get a more normal nine to five um, job. And I had a really exciting role as food development um, chef for KSG and their team. Um, and that was creating menus, um, different dishes, team days for high-end bespoke blue chip companies such as Accenture or Microsoft. Um, it wasn't then when I went into the Rotunda, that was my first step into healthcare. Um, it was from my work here in the Rotunda Hospital that I received the Irish Food Writers Guild Award for outstanding contribution of fresh wholesome food to Irish hospitals. 
which I was very proud. But as um, a single mother to a daughter, I was even more proud of being named one of the 100 women um, changing the landscape of Ireland under the heading of innovation. And that was to do with um, food in healthcare along with modified um, fortified diets. Um, so yeah, I'm very proud of that one. So tips on how to simplify life. I'm going to tell you my experiences um, and that started off in the Rotunda. So when I started in the Rotunda, I was astonished um, at how com confusing and complicated the whole kitchen felt with menus and everything. The guys in the kitchen were killing themselves trying to produce all of this food. Um, it was so much. It was a lot to do. There were sandwiches, there were salads, there was hot food, there was egg dishes, there was everything, you name it. So for me, straight away, I had to simplify. I wanted to strip back the amount of menus you had, that we had, mm -hmm. strip back um, the food on these menus um, using the same three dishes from um, a four week menu cycle that was used. I used that across all parts of the hospital um, from the private, um, public, antenatal, postnatal, um, women that had digestional um, diabetes, probably didn't say that right at all. Um, so what this did for stripping it back was um, that you had the, we had time as chefs, we had time to concentrate on those three dishes. And those three dishes were going to be the best dishes that people tasted, that our patients tasted. I wanted them to look forward to mealtimes, enjoy mealtimes and just forget about why they're there. Um, forget about the babies at home, the daddies at home moaning probably because they're looking after the kids. This time was for them. Um, and that's what we did. We used the same dishes. In general hospital, you could modify and fortify these dishes as you need. Um, so with doing that, it did create a better flow in the kitchen. Food and menus were better quality. And again, there was more time spent on meals. Um, meals were garnished appropriately and enhancing the dish even further. Consistency is key using a nutritional software, um, creating SOPs on how the dish is prepped, how it's cooked, how it is served, how it is garnished. You could take photographs um, of each step of the dish or just use a final photo for reference. Um, and using this software, it also give you all your allergens and all your um, nutritional value needs. Um, it's a great way and I'm sure a lot of hospitals have this software, but just use it. Um, it's really, it, it's a brilliant piece of equipment. Um, be clever, be organised, prep previous day for sauces, for soups, um, marinades, meats, fish, vegetable and um, your plant-based protein that is on the up. Um, you're already getting the flavors into the food that way overnight, even before you start cooking. Um, this way you're ready to hit the ground running and always cook for the day on the day. Batch cooking is okay. It's probably quite difficult to do for wards, but your staff dining room is a huge piece in any hospital and batch cooking is the best way to do that. The food looks fresher, the food is tastier, and all, all over general, it's um, more visually appealing. This way of cooking reduces weight, waste, and we all want less waste. Um, introduce a live cooking station um, into your dining room. Um, it doesn't have to be something big. It can be a freshly poached egg on an avocado toast. It can be a wok station and you have your cooked noodles, you have your cooked protein, animal, plant, your vegetables, noodles, rice and your sauces, chopped herbs, maybe chopped spring onions, and you're just bringing it all together. But the person that you're serving is just feeling like this is being prepared for me, specific to what I want and my flavors. And people are willing to spend that little bit more. Um, they're willing to spend that little bit more on, on their meal. And you know, 
extra revenue coming into the restaurant is um, is always a good thing. You can always put it back into um, the department and put it back into the restaurant, new serving dishes or new smoothie machines or juicers. You know, put it back, give it back. And your your customers are seeing that the money they're, you're, the money they're making, obviously you have a tiny profit and you're putting it back into making things nicer for them. So the blue zone countries and the longevity foods. These people in these countries try and live by move naturally, your tribe, your community, the people you have around you, a positive attitude and eat wisely. So today we are going to talk about the food. Um, so how can we adopt these ways into healthcare cuisine? I feel for me, it's about swapping things out. Um, use olive oil instead of butter. Um, dried peas, canned peas um, and beans are good too. Now I'm not talking about baked beans and everything, um, kidney beans, broad beans, um, those kind of beans. Um, so we can use them, we can use the dried peas and beans um, in salads, we can use them in curries, we can use them in tagines, um, we can use them going through rice just to give that extra punch of protein. It's always good. Your leafy greens, um, your cabbage, who doesn't love cabbage? Um, then you have your ruby shard, your spinach, rocket, basil, all of that. And they always look good. For me, I like to put them last minute if you have roasted veg as a side or through a curry curry sauce, a chiffonade of um, spinach always, you know, it brings out everything. It brings out the color. It looks well. It tastes good. It's good for you. You're adding in more stuff, you know, all the goodness, get it in there is any way you can. And that's what it's about. Um, nuts and seeds. Well, nuts, again, you can have them as sides. You can have them going through your um, side dishes like broccoli, almonds, you know, things that you're probably doing already, but just kind of spread it out a little bit more and um, put your seeds through your porridge, breakfast time, your granolas, just get them in there. Um, tuberous vegetables is potatoes and sweet potatoes, but we all use potatoes, but why not just swap it out with sweet potato um, being a side or as your starch instead of your regular potato, have sweet potato, but you could have... Um, a sweet potato topping on a shepherd's pie or a fish pie rather than the same old potato on top. Your counters, if you're putting them in your staff dining room, your counters will look more vibrant, it's more appealing, everything. So the soya and tofu, this is coming up huge. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to be part of the normal diet. Um, Vegetables and plant-based proteins. Again, the tofu, a good plant-based protein that mimics pulled pork is jackfruit. Now, not fresh jack, jackfruit. If you get tinned jackfruit, it really, if you put a barbecue sauce through it, you would think that you were eating um, pulled pork. So, um, I'll take a drink, sorry. <laughs> Talking too fast, probably. Um, so, for me, again, it's the sides that we can introduce these longevity foods, the sweet potato, kidney beans, thyme, um, a ratatouille with lots of veg, lots of herbs, tomatoes, a pickled slaw. Um, like we don't always have to have two hot sides. We can have a salad as a garnish for something. If you had a tagine, you could have your um, couscous, you could have your bulgur, you could have your um, spelt. These are things that you can have or your um, barley. These are all um, ancient food grains that really play a big role in the blue zone foods. Um, so as a chef, unless you're setting the trends, you need to be following food trends. Um, keep up with chefs that are doing stuff. It's going to be huge. People are going to be vegans, they're going to be vegetarian, flexitarians, vegetarians, pescatarians, everything, everything, you name it, they're going to do it and they're going to try it. And just be ahead of that. Um, like here we have on this, we have um, animal protein versus plant-based protein. There are two curries, one is chicken and one is tofu. If you make the same sauce, 
obviously make it as a vegan sauce. So you're using olive oil and um, you're using coconut milk there, your bases, all the veg. So it's vegan and you're not going to be cut short if you have a patient coming in and she's a vegan. It's easy just to modify that diet. Um, so shaking things up. This for me is, um, this is where the fun, as a chef, this is where you have to come into your own. You, um, the best place for shaking things up is in your staff dining room. Use them as guinea pigs. If it works there, it's going to work in the wards. Um, be creative, enjoy yourself, keep the passion for food alive in you. As I said, follow food trends, what's out there, you want to have some fun. We did in the Rotunda, we did Mexican Day, we did American Diner Day, we did Burrito Day, we did a ramen. And the girls that were serving um, in the restaurant got involved and they dressed up and they had their little aprons and little hats for American Diner Day. And it was fun. It was fun for them serving it. It was fun for us cooking it. It was fun for the people eating it. It can be so much fun. It could bring fun into your kitchen. It can bring fun into your dining room. And... Don't get monotonous. I never say that word right, but you know what I mean. Don't be, don't go into work and get task orientated. You will be bored out of your head. Liven it up. Get going. Use your imagination. Enjoy it. You're working long hours. You're working many days. You're working for many years and it goes easier if you're having fun. So enjoy your work. And one thing for me is always think outside the box and enjoy your job and everybody else will enjoy what you're creating. So thank you so much for listening and taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Joyce, that's fantastic. A brilliant um, piece today. So if you, uh, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. So a, a brilliant uh, way to finish there, Joyce. So I'd like to welcome all the contributors today back to the stage for our panel discussion. There's been great engagement on our Q&A. Um, just to let all of you out there know we're uh, maybe uh, five minutes or so over time. So please do stay with us if you can, because I expect to have some really interesting discussion now uh, with, with all our panelists. So can I start with you and down in CUH, you obviously have gone through a huge um, significant program of work and change down there from what you described to us today. What were the key factors um, that underpinned your success down there, do you think? Um, well, it was very much a team um, work. Um, I think, you know, there's um, in our kitchen, we have maybe 15, 20 chefs there. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, they're the experts when it comes to, to cooking. So it's listening to what um, they were able to do and what we were able to achieve from, from their abilities. The other thing we, we did a bit of as well is that we got master classes for our team. Um, I think in every trade, um, you know, there's always continuous training and it's all very good well to, to have modules on different diets, but um, practical training in a kitchen is very important too, to keep people, and um, in fairness to Joyce, she mentioned it there as well, um, you know, to keep um, ideas fresh um, among the team. So um, a mixture of that and also listening to our patients and what they wanted. Thank you very much, Anne. And I know you are um, gold, uh, achieved the gold award there in the Healthy Eating at, or Happy Heart Healthy Eating at Work Awards. So can I come to you, Regina, there just to say like a significant number of our, our healthcare um, sites are engaged with the with the award scheme now and it's our ambition to have them all engaged and uh, have them all make their way through silver to, to gold. Um, it's a continuous process as you were outlining there and uh, there's a recertification required every two years. I wonder could you tell us a little bit about what you think the value of that recertification process is for the sites? Um, I think, um, you know, the, the value of it, and it's kind of to repeat what Joyce was saying there as well, is just, you know, um, doing the research, I suppose, it gives people the opportunity to regroup and refocus and try new things, you know, um, you know, like Joyce was saying, to shake things up a little bit. So even if you're at gold, I think, it, you know, not to kind of get, you know, lackadaisy or whatever, do you know what I mean? That you just keep going as you are. Um, and exactly, again, just um, listening to Joyce's 
uh, presentation, it just really, you know, I think brings that home that, look, if you keep, you know, chefs always love to change things up, but they don't want to keep going with the same menus all the time. So even if you are at gold, um, really want to encourage people to keep going with the recertifications and to keep, not at maintained, but to keep uh, striving for better, you know, for improvements. And to keep improving the menus because there's always room for improvement and there's you know there's always room to to do things maybe a little bit better or to change things up so i think that's you know the, the important thing about it i know it's two years it probably feels like a long process but it comes around really quickly um and it can take you know a good few months to make um new changes again but definitely not to stop once you've got gold you know keep keep working on it and keep and the chefs will always say like it's much more enjoyable like joy said it's much it's a much more um fun environment to work in if you can try new things all the time yeah thank you very much regina i suppose cooking is it's a it is a creative process so we need to uh, mm. keep that create creativity and creative spark going for for ourselves in 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 the work day um so joyce can i come to you there just in terms of your work with uh, both in the rotunda your work outside of healthcare and, and now with pure joy. For, reflecting on all of that, what do you think are the are good investments or maybe the best investments that we can make to um, improve the food environment in healthcare? Um, for me, for um, to improve the food across the whole HSC setting is nearly to see every HSC hospital, like say a Marriott hotel. If you go into any Marriott hotel, the breakfast is the same, the blankets, the duvet is the same, everything is the same. Nothing changes in any hotel, it's always the same. And I think an investment into the HSC is to get every hospital singing literally from the same hymn sheet, that everybody is working. You go into CUH on Monday and you have a chicken curry. If you go in then to the matter on a, did I say Monday? Monday, you have a chicken curry. Everything is the same. The allergens are the same. Nutrition value is the same. It's presented the same. It's garnished the same. And it's just uniform, totally. And again, chefs might say, oh, well, that's not leaving an awful lot to us on the ground. Like, where do we develop and where do we shine? So like that, in your staff dining room, you work your staff dining room and you try new things. You can also suggest menu changes and see that represented into the HSE recipe collection. And I think that would be brilliant. Sounds really, really fantastic, I suppose. And um, if you, I suppose that's the thing, a, a hotel a chain, if they aim for four star, they aim for five star. Once they hit there, the focus yeah. on keeping that standard. It doesn't necessarily uh, blunt creativity, but it, it, it there's a continuous Absolutely. engagement and process around that. Um, a, re <laughs> a really good idea, the whole HSE recipe bank um, that be that may be one for the healthcare awards some, at some point if we get around to achieving it. Yeah. Um, Marion, uh, I know that kind of whole idea of standardisation uh, is is what's behind all the work that you and um, the the dietitians Barbara and um, Margaret and uh, others over the years have been doing around the, the policies and that. Um, having heard from Joyce and Anne there in terms of. Uh, what the, the key learnings and insights from the front line are within the kitchens. What would you see as a key investment in terms of um, supporting factors for success? So I suppose a key investment would be training. And I mean, on HSE land, we have standardised training to support all staff in catering to, um, to go through the various different therapeutic diets um, in the policy and also the nutrition standards for staff and visitors. So I think investing time in staff so that they can um, upskill and um, everybody understands kind of the standard um, across the board I think would be really valuable. Um, I think another thing is um, investing in your team so if you see somebody who has a bit of spark a bit of something else in them so invest in, invest in them so that you know they can maybe become become a chef or, or, or kind of move into a different area. Um, 
I think as well as that, um, looking at the opportunities that we do have, um, for example, the procurement contracts, making sure that all of the products that you need to be able to deliver your service, um, maybe even considering some of the things now that Joyce have said as well, um, just there now, it may look a little bit different. So making sure that all of the products that you need are, are on that contract to make to make things easier um, in terms of ordering. Um, and I suppose um, then the other thing then is the Healthy Eating Awards, you know, signing up for those um, and moving through from bronze to silver to gold. Um, they would be probably the key investments that I would see. Great, thank you very much, Marion. So again, it's, it's that process is around like uh, engaging in a continuous quality improvement process and, and uh, keeping on board, investing in our staff, investing in, in ourselves, um, and, and seeing the value as we go through the process. Stephen, the, um, there's a huge focus on climate, climate action in all, of our, in all aspects of our lives. And we heard today how important it is to look at that within healthcare. For, um, for catering managers and staff who are listening to today, what are the top two first steps you think they, they, they could take? I would think it's to take a step back and just, you know, I realize my God, catering departments are very busy departments, but, you know, just, just to look at your operation from a sustainable viewpoint and um, kind of, you know, I think people are caught up with the day to day, but it's important to step back every now and again and maybe take the time and, and collaborate maybe with the regional sustainability manager and have a discussion initially about, you know, uh, this, this is our situation, you know, uh, uh, what opportunities are there, you know, these are our current restrictions, but um, to kind of collaborate then and, and work towards, you know, putting a few sustainable uh, ideas in place. But that's, um, I think initially it's it's to take that step back and, and appraise the situation and the sustainability ma managers will be helping in that regard in terms of benchmarking and you know establishing where each hospital currently is you know and then looking towards future targets and how we can get there so very much that kind of take to step back see the journey you want to go and identify the first little steps that you can take and and start start getting those I easy wins to, you know to pick one or two uh kind of no-brainers whereby you can get traction you know and that builds momentum and confidence and interest and you know once you have a bit of success it's to build on that success and keep going you know and i'm thinking over over time that well the probably is there given the the 10 years of work with the uh, clean technology unit down in in CIT, there are tools, there are tips, there are um, supports that, that you and your team have available that people can use. Yeah, th there is quite a lot in place already. And it's really, you know, we have to communicate that to people on the ground and help them, you know, access those tools. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're going to develop and build on those further as well. That's great. So really exciting times ahead for us, for us all um, in, in healthcare, I think, both in terms of the healthier food environment. And I'm really looking forward to, <laughs> to going there. the next time I have to go down to the CUH <laughs> and get a chance to go into the staff restaurant down there um, and uh, all, all the work that's going to be happening around the country in terms of sustainability and, and uh, improving the, um, the food environment for everybody, hopefully. All of you listening will have got lots of inspiration and ideas from, from today. We will be um, sending, out, sending you out a link with a short survey, so do give us feedback. Um, it's always really helpful to hear from you what you found useful, what was uh, helpful, um, and what you'd like to see in the future. I'd really like to thank all our contributors today, Joyce, Anne, Marion, Stephen, and Eileen. Um, it's been fantastic, and without you, uh, we couldn't have done the the, the day. I'd also really like to thank our um, our interpreters as well, and also everyone who has been uh, instrumental in making today happen. Uh, Noreen, Eamon, Paddy, Emer, um, Orna here, and all in the background, and uh, our colleagues Jean and Helena in iMedia. 
So thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. Um, and we will hopefully see you again at another learning and sharing event.